Hello, Mishpacha. It's Courtney America's Jewish Mother. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I am here today with a sort of sobering discussion on um, International Holocaust Remembrance Day about the misuse of the Holocaust in imaginative works, such as Sylvia Plath's collection of poetry, Ariel. Um, so if you are friends with me on Goodreads, you've probably already seen me vent about this a little bit, but I wanted to have a sort of full length discussion video about Sylvia Plath's poem, Daddy, um, and about what I feel is her appropriation of the Holocaust and misuse of it in this poem. Um, so I will leave a link to the full text of the poem of Daddy down below um, if you want to follow along, but I am going to start by actually reading the entire poem. Um, and just as a sort of content warning, um, there is a, at least one curse word in this poem and there's also an ethnic slur. Um, so okay, I'm going to read the whole poem and then uh, we will talk about it. Daddy. You do not do, you do not do any more, black shoe, in which I have lived like a foot for thirty years, poor and white, barely daring to breathe or achu. Daddy, I have had to kill you, you died before I had time, marble heavy, a bag full of God, ghastly statue with one gray toe, big as a Frisco seal, and a head in the freakish Atlantic where it pours bean green over blue in the waters off beautiful Nosset. I used to pray to recover you, ach du. In the German tongue, in the Polish town, scraped flat by the roller of wars, wars, wars. But the name of the town is common. My Polak friend says there are a dozen or two. So I never could tell where you put your foot, your root. I never could talk to you. The tongue stuck in my jaw. It stuck in a barbed wire snare, ich, 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 ich. I could hardly speak. I thought every German was you in the language of scene, an engine, an engine, chuffing me off like a Jew, a Jew to Dachau, Auschwitz, Belsen. I began to talk like a Jew. I think I may well be a Jew. The snows of the Tyrol, the clear beer of Vienna are not very pure or true. With my gypsy ancestress and my weird luck and my Tarok pack and my Tarok pack, I may be a bit of a Jew. I have always been scared of you with your Luftwaffe, your gobbledygoo, and your neat mustache and your Aryan eye, bright blue. Panzer man, panzer man, oh you. Not God, but a swastika so black no sky could squeak through. Every woman adores a fascist, the boot in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. You stand at the blackboard, daddy, in the picture I have of you. A cleft in your chin instead of your foot, but no less a devil for that. No, not any less the black man who bit my pretty red heart in two. I was ten when they buried you. At twenty I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. I thought even the bones would do. But they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue. And then I knew what to do. I made a model of you, a man in black with a Mein Kampf look and the love of the rack and the screw. And I said, I do, I do. So daddy, I'm finally through. The black telephone's off at the root. The voices just can't warm through. If I've killed one man, I've killed two. The vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, seven years if you want to know. Daddy, you can lie back now. There's a stake in your fat black heart and the villagers never liked you. They are dancing and stamping on you. They always knew it was you. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. So I read the whole poem to give you context for uh, what I'm gonna talk about. So there's a lot going on in this poem. Um, there is an examination of Sylvia Plath's relationship to her father. Um, there also seems to be some symbolic um, representation of the figure of her husband, Ted Hughes, with her father. Um, there was a stanza in there where 
Plath says, I do, I do, sort of echoing, you know, marriage ceremony where you say, I do. Um, so it seems like she's sort of conflating the two here. Um, and either way, there are some, you know, comparisons that you heard to um, the father and or uh, her husband, Ted Hughes, being a Nazi um, and to Plath herself being a, a Jewish victim. Um, so, you know, there's this, this metaphor that, that gets used there. Um, so I, I want to talk some about reception of this, critical reception of this poem, um, before I sort of give my own two cents on it. Um, so there is an article from the New Yorker that I found while I was doing some research for this, um, and I'm going to link that down below, but here's the part I want to share. Daddy has had a mixed reception. There are critics who condemn Plath for appropriating the Holocaust for private purposes. Whatever her father did to her, it could not have been what the Germans did to the Jews, Leon Wieseltier writes in the New York Re Review of Books, 1976. The metaphor is inappropriate. Familiarity with the hellish subject must be earned, not presupposed. The late Irving Howe, in his book, The Critical Point, 1973, writes, there is something monstrous, utterly disproportionate when tangled emotions about one's father are deliberately compared with the historical fate of the European Jews. Something sad if the, com if the comparison is made spontaneously. Seamus Heaney writes in his book, The Government of the Tongue, 1989, a poem like Daddy, however brilliant a tour de force it can be acknowledged to be, and however its violence and vindictiveness can be understood or excused in light of the poet's parental and marital relations, remains nevertheless so entangled in biographical circumstances and rampages so permissively in the history of other people's sorrows that it simply overdraws its fights to our sympathy. So basically all three of those men who were just quoted, right, are talking about the sort of misuse of the Holocaust here. Um, and it's a misuse because Sylvia Plath herself was not Jewish. She did not have anyone Jewish in her family. Um, there was no one connected to her who perished in the Holocaust, um, and she references not only Jews, but also the Roma people, um, and also Polish people who were also sometimes sent to death camps regardless of whether they were Jewish or not. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on in this New Yorker article. On the other side, George Steiner honors Plath for her active identification of total communion with those tortured and, ma and massacred. In his essay, Dying is an Art, 1965, Steiner writes of her as one of a number of young contemporary poets, novelists, and playwrights, themselves no way implicated in the actual Holocaust, who have done the most to counter the general inclination to forget the death camps. He calls Daddy one of the very few poems I know of in any language to come near the last horror. And yet, after saying this, after calling Daddy the Guernica of modern poetry, Steiner is troubled. Something doesn't sit right with him. Are these final poems entirely legitimate, he asks, and then in a turnaround, one that Irving Howe pounces on and sees as devastating to his early comparison with Guernica, asks, in what sense does anyone, himself uninvolved and long after the event, commit a subtle larceny when he invokes and echoes the trappings of Auschwitz and appropriates an enormity of ready emotion to his own private design? Three years later, writing of Daddy in the Cambridge Review, Steiner is still fretting about the question, what extraterritorial right had Sylvia Plath? She was a child, plump and golden in America, when the trains actually went, to draw on the reserves of animate horror in the ash in the children's shoes. Do any of us have license to locate our personal disasters, raw as these may be, in Auschwitz? So, um, so even a critic like George Steiner, who kind of originally praised Plath's use of Holocaust imagery as an act of, you know, total communion and identification with um, the victims of the death camps, sort of later seemed to backtrack and somewhat recant his earlier statement and be troubled about it the more he thought about it. Um, so that's, again, sort of just an overview of some of some critical responses to it. Again, I will leave the link to this article from the New Yorker that I just quoted from um, down below. Um, so in terms of my own kind of take on this, right, I've already said Sylvia Plath didn't have any connection herself to the Holocaust. 
um, which is why I feel like even though we didn't have necessarily have this language in 1965 when this collection was published, right today we would probably call this cultural appropriation. Um, I also feel like it is an abuse of the Holocaust. Um, philosopher Theodore Adorno kind of famously said that there can be no poetry after Auschwitz, and while there's some, uh, you know, debate still over what exactly he meant by that. I feel pretty sure that the use of the Holocaust as a metaphor to describe your own kind of tortured relationship to your father and husband um, would probably fall under that category. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to say here is that um, in doing some research for my dissertation, um, I read a book by philosopher Richard Bernstein, and I'm, I'm not actually sure if Bernstein is still alive or not. If he is, he's probably in his late 80s or early 90s. Um, but Bernstein published a book in 2005 called The Abuse of Evil, um, which was basically about the sort of corruption of politics and religion in a post-9-11 world. Um, and anyway, so in that book, Bernstein talks about what he calls in the title The Abuse of Evil. Um, and so in that book, he says that the new discourse of good and evil lacks nuance, subtlety, and judicious discrimination. Um, similarly, I think that Platt's use of the Holocaust in this poem, Daddy, lacks nuance, subtlety, and judicious discrimination. Um, so Bernstein goes on in this book, The Abuse of Evil, to say, simply labeling something or some person as evil is not moral inquiry for all the emotional appeal of this labeling. It obscures and distorts our choices. Um, and again, I agree. And I feel like Sylvia Plath's imaginative identification with the Jewish people, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't do anything except sort of compare her father and or her partner husband um, to Nazis without any sort of critical interrogation of what is meant by that and what are the distinctions between her own private situation and a situation of the Holocaust of like, you know, insane orders of magnitude greater. Um, and then lastly, the other thing I wanted to say from Bernstein's book is that he says that in the abuse of evil, there is a manipulative and sometimes cynical fusing together of widely disparate phenomena into a single reified evil enemy, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Palestinian suicide bombers, and Chechnyan rebels are lumped together as if they were a single evil enemy or part of a single global conspiracy. And again, I would apply that to Plath's poem, Daddy, because... Um, there is a fusing together of wildly disparate phenomena, right? So you've got, um, you've got the Holocaust on one hand and um, just the systematic um, genocide, attempted genocide of an entire people fused together with whatever evil or mistreatment um, Plath herself suffered at the hands of her father. Um, and, you know, honestly, I don't really know that much about Plath's relationship with her father. I know for sure her husband, Ted Hughes, was, was abusive toward her, and I'm not trying to minimize that, but I feel like her use of the Holocaust in this poem minimizes the Holocaust. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about, um, about this, again, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, so this seems appropriate. Um, in terms of poems I would suggest about the Holocaust, uh, I got my anthology of Jewish American literature here, so I'm going to recommend two poems, um, and these are both from Jews who immigrated to the United States, were able to immigrate to the United States in the, um, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, um, the first one I'm going to quote from, um, Kadia Molodowski, was able to immigrate to the United States in 1935 um, before things got really bad and she couldn't leave anymore. Um, and she wrote a poem in 1945 called God of Mercy. This is translated by Irving Howe. And I'm going to read the first stanza of this. O oh God of mercy, choose another people. We are tired of death tired of corpses, we have no more prayers. Choose another people. 
We have run out of blood for victims. Our houses have been turned into desert. The earth lacks space for tombstones. There are no more lamentations nor songs of woe in the ancient texts. Um, hi, sorry for the jump cut. I'm having a hard time making it through this Jacob Gladstein poem without crying. So, um, so anyway, the second poem I wanted to read is by Jacob Gladstein, who was a pretty prominent figure in the Yiddish literary scene in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. So Gladstein um, was born in Poland, I believe. Yes. Um, and he immigrated to the United States in the mid-19-teens. Um, but he traveled back and forth to Poland because his family, um, and especially his mother, still lived there. And he was there as late as 1934. And it says um, in the little introductory part about him, when, in 1934, he returned to Lublin to see his dying mother, Glatstein gained an awareness of the impending tragedy that would lead to the destruction of Jewish-European culture. Um, and anyway, so then, uh, so anyway, so he published this poem without Jews in 1946, which I will now attempt to get through without crying this time. Without Jews, there will be no Jewish God. If we go away from the world, the light will go out in your poor tent. For ever since Abraham saw you in a cloud, your fire has been on all Jewish faces, your radiance in all Jewish eyes. We have shaped you in our own image. In every country, in every town, a stranger lived with us, the Jewish God. And every shattered Jewish head is God's disgraced, broken bowl. For we were your vessel of light, the living sign of your palpable wonder. Now our dead heads are counted in millions. The stars around you flicker out. The memory of you is, de is dimmed. Your kingdom will soon fade away. All the Jewish sowing and planting is burned. On dead grass cries the dew. The Jewish dream and the Jewish reality are ravaged. They die together. Whole tribes asleep, babies, women, young and old. Even your pillars, the rocks, the 36 just, sleep their dead, eternal sleep. Who will dream you? Who will remember? Who will deny you? Who will long for you then? Who will go to you on a nostalgic bridge away from you to return again? The night is eternal for a dead people, sky and earth wiped out. The light goes out in your poor tent. The last Jewish hour flickers. Jewish God, soon you are no more. Um, by the way, this poem is translated by um, Benjamin Harshaw and Barbara Harshaw from the Yiddish. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, please feel free to leave any comments or thoughts down below. Uh, and until next time, would it kill you to call your mother?